I'm going to talk a bit about JC and Stretch for the Debian installer part. So, as a forward, I would like to apologize a bit for the people already in mini DevConf in Cambridge because they might have heard some bits about the Jesse part, but fortunately, they've got the stretch one to still discover. Anyway, looking back, uh, looking back at Wheezy, we had <coughs> a first release candidate for the installer like a month before the full freeze, which was quite Mm, a short timing. So we try to do better with Jesse, and we managed to release the installer in March with a freeze in November, which was like a big step ahead. Looking at the number of releases, Wizzy was a bit more productive because we, have, we had the first alpha, which was like a bit long to come, but then we had four betas in like four consecutive months, which was way better, and then uh, three release candidates, and the last one was the installer used in the Wizzy release. For Jesse, um, we had first an alpha, then two beta, then three release candidates, so we didn't quite manage to keep the pace we tried to have for the Wizzy release cycle, so we probably could do better for Stretch and above. As far as architecture changes go, uh, we had quite some changes with the addition of some ARM stuff, new fancy blah Steve know, knows about, and PPC uh, with a new version uh, going 64 bits as well. As as for the removals, we had S390 uh, who disappeared because it was already replaced with the X version. We had Spark Go, oh, we're so sad, and Italium as well. And K3BSD was like um, a, a pity because I know that Steven has, lot, has done a lot of work, especially in the last months, to try and keep up with all the changes and the blockers that were stepping up. But being mostly a single man alone is like hard, so we couldn't quite keep K3BSD in. But anyway, um, moving back, uh, moving forward to the default desktop, we had an early switch to XFC, and the idea was to try and see how stuff would go, and maybe step, take a step back and decide that. That wasn't the, a good direction. So we discovered quite a few bugs, like in Debian CD, uh, we weren't using the proper set of packages and so on, so the, the switch was not totally transparent. We had some accessibility issues, mainly regression, meaning that, uh, for example, blind people couldn't quite as easily as before install and use Debian by default, which was a big step um, back because it's really hard uh, when you have some disabilities to actually figure out what a problem can be and how to fix it and uh, how to get some help. So that was really a big issue for us. So we had some desktop selection at some point, but that was happening at the Syslinux uh, time, which means the very first prompt where you just click in enter because the highlighted entry is installed and that's what you want to do. But you could go to some advanced menu and then select something that was on the default, but that was not the right place to select the desktop you want to install half an hour later. So. Now the prompt has been moved into the regular installation process. At task, uh, task cell time, we are asking whether you want to install a desktop, and you have a choice of the desktop you want to install. It's even possible to install several of them, and then to pick the right one at uh, the session point. Um, and looking back, at uh, the XFC switch, um, there was some desktop qualification that was launched, I believe, in Portland uh, by Joy. The idea was to compare uh, the pros and cons of the many desktops uh, that we have 
and to figure out which one was going to be uh, used for, um, for this uh, release. So we decided to go back to GNOME because the pros were like uh, slightly better than other desktops, but only for EMD64 and, uh, and the 32 bits version because the support as far as um, uh, OpenGL and stuff is uh, mostly working there and not elsewhere. So we still have XFC on uh, the other platforms. So that was a jury as well. Um, we had Grub installer, which was kind of um, counterintuitive because if you boot it like from a CD-ROM installing, it was defaulting to DevSDA or whatever your disk is called, and that was okay. If you boot it from USB, like a USB stick, it would usually pick the USB stick to install into, but also not prompt you just in case my, maybe that was an issue. And it was a, actually a very old bug, but back in Squeeze and Wheezy, there weren't so many people booting from USB sticks. And that also depends on the order uh, in BIOS or EFI, or maybe on the Linux side, I'm not sure exactly how the numbering goes and so on. So that was really uh, leading to, to major pain uh, for users, and there was no way to avoid that bug except for setting that on the command line before booting everything. So we decided to, impl to implement a prompt, like which device would you like to install uh, the Grubs file, uh, the MBR, and so on uh, onto. So that's annoying when you have a single disk, but it's actually quite hard to cover all the use cases, so we decided to prompt in all cases. We might try to have something more smart at some point, but we really need to be careful not to introduce that kind of bug again. So that was Vincent, not Steve, McIntyre, uh, anyway. Um, we had some big regression coming up. We, were, uh, we knew it was going to, ha to happen, so UDEV used to report the missing firmware uh, on its own right and exposing that to user space. So it was easy to figure out that, oh, maybe you would like to have this firmware because stuff is not working as, um, otherwise. But that was racy and buggy and not done right. So UDEV people decided to remove that feature. But it was possible to patch hardware detect to look at kernel logs where Ben implemented some structured log, uh, logging. So it was possible to, using grep and tail and whatever we have in DI, which is like a very basic environment, to determine that, oh, maybe we m are missing this file and you could be, um, you can put it into some USB stick or redo your installation image and then you know that your wireless card is not working because it's missing this specific file. Oops. So that was mainly Ben for the kernel part and Peter for the implementation in uh, hardware detect. We had some fun with APT and CD DVD. Like we are using some uh, dark command in APT, which is APT CD ROM, to scan uh, the label and figure out whether we are on the first CD or maybe we are using a second one and play with uh, several of them. But this command is very only used within the eye. So FT developer weren't quite aware of the non-interactive non -interactive way we were using it. So that broke, but uh, that was easily and quickly fixed, so that was quite okay. So FT people were very kind to upload that very quickly. We had some party fun as well, because there was some new upstream release. I was preparing for a Debian installer release, and one day everything was working fine, and the next day, because at some point you have to sleep, I rerun the build, like uploading the statistics for the language f uh, in order to, to get the final upload ready, and partitioning was totally broken all of a sudden. Uh -huh. So that was actually parted going into testing behind my back, and this, um, this version had some behavioral changes like 
not uh, supporting some operation or mandating that you do this and that before doing other stuff. So Colin was very responsive and he patched uh, m mostly all partman dash something um, UDEVs in um, on the installer side and then uploaded stuff and then I had to poke into incoming to see what was there and started uh, building uh, new local CDs and figure out that, oh, but the swap is working as well and iterate, uh, so that took a few days. And when I kind of complained to FTP masters that uh, it's, it takes some time because you've got to, to go through the install and do stuff and blah, blah, blah. They were like, well, oh, but you, we could open incoming to the public. There's nothing private in there, so let's do that. So that was a nice side effect. So that was all thanks to Colin and FTP team. Ah, oh, system D. Actually, that was like not a, a no-brainer because we had an issue where the, insta the, insta the installation process was like uh, everything going, uh, going right. And then when we, you rebooted, you had like a 30 uh, second hang for whatever reason. And all of a sudden, twice, this one disappeared. And that was actually the priority overrides that were updated by FTP masters to promote systemd like the default uh, init system. And when you actually boot it with systemd and no longer with CSV init, ta-da, the bug was gone. So that was a fortunate uh, coincidence, but I asked FTP people to maybe poke me before changes uh, that could affect the, the installer. So that was the system maintainers that did the, the, world, um, the world work and everything was transparent. We had nothing to change in the eye, just consume the change in, uh, on the FTP master side. For wireless support, we had some fun, uh, again, because the eye is very limited uh, an an environment and UDEBs are kind of butchered or adapted version of the regular Debian packages. And sometimes some bits are missing. So we put some patches into the WPA package to, get, uh, to be able to get more debugging. So you still have to go through syslog and whatever, but it's actually possible to get error messages now, which is fine. And with these uh, patches, it was possible to figure out that some crypto modules were missing in the, um, on the Linux UDEVs, so they were added and ta-da, more wireless support in the eye. So the WPA maintainer is Stefan. We had some fun with many things, actually. With Punjabi, uh, which is, I believe, a language used in India, Nobody else, uh, that must be okay. Um, the rendering with the default font, uh, which is probably deja vu, was not really satisfactory. So it was proposed to extend the fonts Lloyd Go package to build a new uh, UDEB, use it, and we only had to add the mapping. Uh, Punjabi is using this extra font, and that was, uh, that was okay. So Aman is the reporter and Vasudev and Christian the, <laughs> the racy uploaders because they were like, oh, a new patch, let it go. <laughs> Oops, it's already there, my, my upload was rejected. That was a bit strange. So we had some breakage at some point with uh, font config uh, because uh, some files were missing in the UDEB. Again, the duplication of work between DEB and UDEB, sometimes bits are missing. So we had some kind of sans, uh, sans, uh, font in the graphical shell, which was like totally broken. So it was easy to fix, just prod maintainers until font config UDEB is fixed. And Jocelyn did that. We had a big change, which was uh, user parameters, because it was decided on the upstream Linux uh, side that dash dash was meaning something really important and having parameters before and after being consumed by systemd um, 
so there was a change, and we were actually using this dash dash separator to separate stuff for the installer, for the kernel, and so on. So we added a triple dash to work around the kernel change, but that involved patching Debian installer, uh, some util uh, package, Debian CD, the installation guide, and so on. And that's all Jan's fault for having found, found out um, that issue way before others. Because it was breaking the installer in a very subtle way, and it was not immediately uh, um, trivial to understand what was going on and what was the, different, uh, the difference um, compared to the image from the day or the week before. We dropped uh, 32 bits a bit more. Uh, I mean, we went, we went up, I mean, in terms of requirements. Uh, I was going to say that. <laughs> um, so yeah, actually, it was not reported that we had broken support for old Arch. And so it was decided to actually advertise what we were supposed to actually support. So Ben did mo most of the work, uh, patching everything and changing stuff in Linux and then fixing UDEVs because there was some missing patch at some point. But uh, now we should be a bit more honest about what we support. And I believe that's the, the last slide for Chessy. We had some fun with Macintosh uh, because we have some mixed environment and EFI and so many combinations that it's totally crazy. And trying to add EFI support for 32 bits was breaking, or is breaking, uh, old Macintosh uh, computers because apparently the firmware is not smart enough to figure out that, oh, there's BIOS or EFI, let's do one of them and figure out. So that led to enabling EFI in 32 bits anyway and adding a Mac flavor to support all um, computers. So it's a bit inesthetic uh, as far as documentation and in intuition go, but that's probably the best we could do. So again, that was Steve. So looking at Stretch, I'm going to talk about stuff that is already there stuff we are considering and stuff you could possibly help with if you come to us and talk to us. Uh, I'm going to start by comparing release cycles. Uh, it's been only four months since the JC release. There's uh, already two releases of the installer out. If you are looking, I'm not making any promise, uh, at a freeze in November again, uh, that would be a first release 16 months uh, before the freeze, which would be way better than any other release before. And you might have uh, heard me complain about Linux transition. I mean, it takes some time and it's might, it might not be immediately easy to understand why this is so crucial to have Linux in testing. Um, the fact is, we have many changes that depend on the on the minimal kernel version. Uh, for example, on the ARM side, uh, especially the the new flavor, we have many changes, and the configuration in DI is uh, committed to Git on a regular basis, and we can't easily go back to a very old kernel, undo everything, and then say, okay, there's no new kernel in testing, we can do a release anyway, because we, we would have to roll back too many changes. So in this regard, we must go forward and wait for the kernel to transition to testing. So there was a first big jump, so 3.16 to 4.0, three months after the Jesse release, so that's the, the point where, where it migrated to testing we managed to have a stretch shell for one release for the, just after that. And when I noticed that the, the new release entered testing, I was like, hmm, maybe we should do a release right now, just in case. So it should be easy to spot any regression that might be uh, kernel related by just running with alpha one and alpha two. 
And speaking of uh, Stretch Alpha 1, that, uh, that was really a close call because uh, I knew there were some proposals on Debian Devil. We could change the way we are um, naming interfaces. So I was like, hmm, that, the, uh, that might have some impact on the installer at some point. But I was like busy with other things. And actually, what we ended up with uh, just before the Alpha 1 release was the installer system using ETH0, as usual, and the install system using whatever uh, name the is relevant for this specific hardware or virtualized uh, interface meaning that the networking that you had configured within the eye didn't work in the install system. So that was, uh, and thankfully, um, timing and all that, um, the system D maintainers uh, noticed that I was closing in for the release and were like, oops, you might want to take this and that patch. So we managed to avoid releasing or attempting to release a broken installer because we would have uh, failed all tests after uh, hours of uh, CD images built, so that was, uh, that would have been um, quite some delays, quite some time wasted. As uh, I spoke a bit about funds before, uh, over the last uh, release cycle, there was some uh, policy change on the funds packaging team and they went for, from TTF-something to font-something for most of them. And we had some transitional packages that are still pointing to old packages and not to the new ones provided by the new source packages. So we are lagging behind uh, from something like uh, one or two years uh, for some fonts. So we are basically missing some character or glyph updates or maybe some Unicode support. But that shouldn't be an issue to just rename the packages and go on with it. But there was a big change uh, with Chinese, Japanese, and Korean, which is what uh, CGK is for. We used to have a very special package built by looking into all the templates we are using to ask questions during the installation. We were up to get sourcing some of them and looking into SVN and Git depending on all the packages and sometimes packages moved or were converted to from SVN to Git and there was like no error handling, so we didn't notice, and f uh, glyphs were missing, and it was totally crazy. And fortunately, um, we had some proposal to just use the new one, which is small enough to avoid being butchered to only keep only the, the glyph we need, and the size uh, bump is relatively, uh, not really small, but okay, given that we are getting uh, full glyph support, we are not going to, to have to worry about uh, possibly missing some, some new, new questions, some new characters, and therefore some glyphs. So, so far, so good. Um, we had some updated default as well. Uh, I believe the graphical install was, was like introduced in mid-2000. Uh, maybe 2005 or six or seven or whatever. But it was like really new and it was not made the default until we decided that maybe we should for Wizzy or Jesse and we actually didn't because too many things to do. So now that's done. And we have also a multi-arch image making it possible to install an Intel platform in uh, 64 or uh, 32 bits. And now we default to the 64 version because, well, it's, a, it's about time. Coming up next, uh, making the, the menus in the multi-arch image a bit uh, smaller by not listing EMD64 and i386. By using some conditional stuff in SysLinux, it's possible to detect the CPU we are running on and only display the right block of option. So that's all, uh, that's all DJ's fault, so you may thank him. Um, I'm not sure how I'm doing as for time. Okay, thank you. 
Um, we have GTK Plus. Uh, we are still using uh, the version 2 because it's supported, so that's quite okay. And I was like, oh, I don't know what to do for DI, so let's look at CDEPCONF GTK. So basically, DI is asking a lot of questions through DEPCONF. We have the text installer and the graphical installer, but both are using exactly the same set of questions, just presented differently through CDEPCONF. So I looked into porting CDEPCONF, the GTK frontend from uh, GTK2 to GTK3. It's actually quite trivial. There are some repenting function that I wasn't really sure what they were for because not porting them was leading to okayish results. So there's quite uh, some bit to, to polish for this patch uh, series. But also, I didn't feel the urge to move to GTK3 because its UDEB has been regularly not installable in a DI context. First, it was um, depending on Caro object for which there was no UDEB, and then ATSPI. So I reported some bugs. UDEBs were introduced, but basically we have more packages, more more impact on on all these packages because they are caught up into the. Um, the DI release process, so using version 2 just works for now. And we uh, we now have libepoxy, which is a new package missing a UDEB uh, at the moment. So in addition to cleaning up the patch series, we have to port or maybe rework uh, the theme, uh, basically, uh, so that we don't use the default ad waiter, I believe, uh, GTK theme. and have something a bit Debianish, so it's probably g getting worked on, but um, in a few months. On the X side, we are using Input F Dev uh, for both keyboard and mouse on Linux, and a separate keyboard and a separate mouse uh, packages for FreeBSD and Herd. Um, there's a new component uh, which is uh, Input Lib Input using Lib Input. Uh, but that one hasn't been tested outside the eye uh, yet, so we are not going to make it the default into the eye. Uh, we are going to wait a bit that X maintainers uh, experiment in uh, unstable and maybe testing, and then only consider doing the, the same switch into the eye. So again, a matter of months probably. Uh, we had some artwork uh, to update. So we had uh, Paul uh, organize a kind of contest People were submitting uh, their, their theme and screenshots and whatever. And in the end, the lines uh, theme by Juliette was selected, which had some nice side effects because Juliette joined us at Mini Depconf in Lyon uh, earlier this year and gave a talk uh, telling us uh, about what happened uh, as a new contributor in Debian. Um, not necessarily uh, very technical, uh, technical with pencil and whatever you, you would be using to, to do art stuff. So there was some kind of a clash of culture because you have to, you, to get used to the tools. No. So there's a video of the talk in French, but if you want to discover that a bit more, uh, she's actually there as well. So. Paul was volunteered again, so... <laughs> One of the biggest issues we have in Debian beside firmware, which is not something I, will, uh, I, plan, I plan to talk about because we just have some buff and details will follow. But uh, the biggest issue besides that is secure boot because at the moment it's possible to use EFI Yay! But not with secure boot enabled, which means that by default, many ma machines, um, modern ma machines, come with secure boot enabled, and users have to fiddle with EFI settings to, I don't want to use secure boot, which might require setting a root password first because the m menu can be hidden, which is not really user friendly. So, a 
I believe in Portland as well, a plan was designed to get secure boot signing keys and then update whatever bit of info uh, uh, is needed to use them. Package shim, which is basically a building block we can put between uh, UFI and Grub or whatever. So there are some chain loading involved. And then merge support into the eye and then test and get broken stuff, but try to fix them. So that was mostly Todd's plan, uh, I believe, until he uh, didn't feel quite like uh, keeping on uh, with that. And Matthew, who is the Shims uh, author, and if you don't know him, you really should be reading his blog post because mm. it's really a nice word to discover. Um, one of the big issues of the day, or the week, or the month, is GCC5 becoming the default and the huge transition going with it. So if you get caught up into this net, it's like months of delay for uh, a possible uh, migration to testing. But ta-da, we don't use C++ in the eye, so we're basically okay. <laughs> basically because um, Actually, some packages are used uh, like SysLinux, uh, the unstable version, because it's a build dependency, so pulled from unstable. And when compiled with GCC5, it produces some images that are not bootable. So part of the release is actually broken, but that's just one image among many others. So that's basically it. And I'm going to get back to Xdebug stuff later. One of the other big plans uh, was proposed by Ansgar, which is trim the list of packages we are installing uh, by default, because it's huge. There are many stuff that have nothing to do there. So we should be able to reduce default install size, be it uh, with DI, in shoot, in LXC, Docker, whatever. But we have to be very careful with the init system because at the, um, at the moment it's pulled by priority. So if it doesn't get pulled by default now, we have to have some bits into the eye to actually install something to boot the machine with. And we have some pending feature requests because people like to meet me and tell me that they would like to have that into the eye, so they volunteer, that's nice. We had some ISO loopback, uh, which was requested a long time ago, but it was a bit uh, difficult to merge at the time because too many packages were touched at the same time, but there was nothing to actually enforce the lock step. So it was possible to update this and that package and breaking other use cases, I mean, uh, um, more common use cases. So I decided not to, to take the dispatch uh, then. But uh, we have a volunteer to help me sort out what is risky, what is not, and whether we want to have some uh, depends or breaks or conflicts or whatever to ensure that nothing breaks because stuff get uh, could get uh, out of sync. Oops. Um, we had some reports about multipass being being broken. Uh, so the multipass block devices, not the the IOS uh, stuff, uh, the TCP stuff. Uh, we have Matthew, uh, who works on Ubuntu, who is willing to port, uh, to resubmit an, uh, an updated uh, series of patches so that we have something that works again with the current version of Multipass, which was very different from the version uh, we were using when the first series of patches were was submitted. So that's, uh, that's nice. And I heard about DNSSEC support. Uh, Robert was asking maybe that could be an option for the installer. And I went after him and was like, it's easy. There's multiple ways to do it. But actually, implementation is easy, but the decision is not. Because there are so many use cases where DNSSEC would break stuff and user would complain and maybe switch distribution and whatever. So it's apparently prudent to not do that right now. Wait a bit for some other distribution to try it out and I run stuff and then only decide whether we are going to, to add an option. Uh, I mean a non 
hidden option to, to add uh, DNSSEC support uh, from the eye. And yesterday evening, I was asked about uh, HTTPS support because uh, basically the work has been done uh, by Colin in Ubuntu already, but uh, apparently in Debian we don't really need it, uh, so we didn't get uh, those patches. So we would have to, to discuss a bit, see what we would gain uh, by merging H uh, HTTPS support and whether there would be any issues uh, with it. And finally, we have new maintainers for some a bit unloved uh, packages. We have a desktop launcher for DI in live images, making it possible to boot a system with a live image. And when one is happy with it, we can just click a button and that would start DI. So that didn't quite was maintained uh, for a while, but Ian uh, stepped in, so that's uh, all nice. That was like yesterday. And I believe yesterday as well, Andreas uh, stepped up uh, to maintain the I Netboot Assistant, which is a tool to make it easy to download the right files for your platform, put them into some PXE um, uh, setup, and then even add a menu so that you can have some PXE uh, server with multiple images and multiple, multiple platforms supported on the, on the same device. And GNU PG, so that was uh, DKG coming up uh, to us, trying to figure out uh, how to move GPG UDEB, GPGV UDEB from the GNU PG1 to the GNU PG2 um, package. I'm going to skip a bit because that's again uh, mentioned later. Um, I took, uh, I mailed DDA twice about freezing the UDEBs from time to time. Basically, wh what I meant when parted sneaked in um, while I was preparing the release uh, could have been prevented by, s by telling Britney or release tool to just block everything producing UDEBs. So I've done that uh, a few times already. I'm going to do that again. If you want or need your package to migrate to testing anyway, you can come to me and we can discuss the pros and cons and maybe it's going to wait anyway, maybe it's going to get adjourned into testing uh, because it's badly needed and we would have a broken release otherwise. So basically to sum it up, if your package ships a UDEB, you can see that is block UDEB, uh, so in the excuses uh, pages, in which case you talk to me please. Uh, if you plan to implement changes affecting the, uh, the, so the installer or the install system, it would be nice to contact Debian Boot to tell us a bit in advance. If you notice a bug uh, affecting the installer, uh, for example, the syslinux producing images that can't boot, please use X debug CC so that Deb uh, Debian Boot gets uh, a copy of the bug and is aware of the issue and maybe try to speed things up, uh, like urgenting a fix into testing, or maybe using testing proposed updates to fix Linux uh, quicker or whatever. Many thanks. <laughs> Are there any questions? What is the current status of VLAN support in DI? Do you know that? I believe we are still to the point where Philip said we should rewrite these patches at some point. I'm not sure we went so further. No VLAN support for stretch? Or for now, no. Okay. But apparently the patches were not totally crazy, just crappy code and might just be written in a clean way. So because from uh, what I can see, IP root, which is, uh, well, the support is already there. So it just needs net CFD probably to. I believe that's uh, what the patches were doing, yeah.
you mentioned shortly the interface naming scheme yep. and the problem of it. Uh, do you plan to make it uh, configurable? I mean, the if if I want to change it after in installation, that may cause problems. You mean moving from if names to Mac again, or uh, renaming interfaces? Or just excluding BIOS dev name, <coughs> my favorite, but uh, others may have other preferences. Uh, I believe that it's possible to, to switch away from native names with a kernel command line. Yes, and it's possible to switch it off completely, but uh, I, just, uh, I just like to change the, the priority of the various naming uh, uh, I believe that's something that should be discussed with systemd people, uh, because I'm not really sure that DI can do anything about it. It, it's possible by configuring systemd or udev. Uh, okay, so whatever. maybe there's some stuff, some advanced question that we could add uh, in the export mode to make that configurable directly from the eye instead of installing a system and then going back in uh, after a reboot. So yeah, that's, that's what probably I'd possible. I'd like yeah. to ask for. Yeah. So he, here's one of the system D maintainers. Uh, this was actually uh, we discussed that that we would like to have DI provide a uh, DI precede option for that. This is better this way. Um, but what we don't want to reintroduce is the old uh, uh, network generator. But uh, simply switching off the new network interface naming scheme, that, that's something which we thought would be useful to have in the installer. So it uses the correct names in the installer and the installed systems. And it should be pretty easy to do. You just need to create a, a file for um, mm -hmm. Which uh, UDF looks at and Network D looks at. So, if you are uh, open to take a patch for that for DI, then totally. Then yeah, we can do that. Okay, thank you. Any other question? <laughs> thank you again.